This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, my name is Gordon Smith. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist and chair of the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity today to talk to Vera Brill, who is the first author on a very interesting and important article in the journal Neurology that reports the results of a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of the corticosparing effects of intravenous immunoglobulin myasthenia gravis. Dr. Brill is a professor and director of neurology and deputy physician-in-chief for economic affairs at University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. Vera, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. It's my pleasure, Gordon. Well, let's jump right in. And uh, I think before we get to the results here in a moment, I thought it might be helpful for you just to frame the question that this trial is asking and trying to address and why that's so important to us in patient care. As we all know, corticosteroids are really highly effective in treating myasthenia gravis, and they work in a relatively short time frame compared to non-steroidal immunosuppressive agents. But there are a multiple of side effects and adverse effects that you can get with corticosteroids with prolonged use. So any alternatives that work quickly and reduce the corticosteroid burden, these are highly desirable. IVIG works fairly quickly within weeks, and it has shown efficacy in my senior gravis as compared to placebo or as compared to plasma exchange and works fairly quickly. So it is a rational question to ask if you added IVIG to corticosteroids, could you really drop the corticosteroid dose very quickly? So let's get to it. What's the bottom line here? Now, I take care of a lot of patients with myasthenia. What do I need to know from the results of this study when I go to clinic tomorrow? So it's important to know that the study did not show that you could drop corticosteroids quickly by adding IVIG. The ability to drop your corticosteroid dose was the same if you added IVIG or placebo in this relatively brief duration study. The other thing you really need to know from this, and we'll hit this a few times during the podcast, is that you need to taper corticosteroids slowly. And you'll find out here that some of the patients became unresponsive. They deteriorated as the corticosteroids were tapered, and they were not responsive to interventions. And there were even deaths in both arms of the study. So adding IVIG does not guarantee that you can reduce the corticosteroid dose in the short term. And just to orient our listeners who have not yet read this article, and I know they all will, uh, this was a, a, a 30, 36-week trial, as I recall. Is that right? Yes, it was. Yeah. I'm reminded a little bit of BDMG, which I know you're familiar with. For our listeners, this was a trial looking at whether or not a rituximab allowed patients with myasthenia gravis to taper off their steroids. And that, that trial was thought of as an air quotes negative uh, but it, it turned out that we were able to taper most people uh, significantly on their steroids. This was kind of similar, right? Both treatment groups were able to get well along in their steroid taper. I think 63% of patients in the placebo arm in your trial were able to reduce their steroid books by 50% or more. Can you maybe compare, contrast? What does this mean in the context of BDMG? Well, really, it's disappointing. It's not just BDMG, but other studies have shown the lack of steroid sparing effect of non steroidal immunosuppressants and that there's no difference in ability to taper. And I don't know if this is because corticosteroids are so effective that adding something else isn't helping, or perhaps the studies need to be longer in duration. But the mycophenolate studies showed that steroids were very protective and the BDMG, you, there was no difference. So I'm not sure that steroid sparing is a good endpoint to try to measure in these studies. I was going to ask whether we should even be doing trials that uh, focus on a primary or use a primary outcome of steroid taper. Do you have thoughts about that? What, is this a clinical trial design that we should be using in the future? I don't think we should use it in a short-term trial, Gordon. I think you have to do trials of longer duration. I don't think 36 weeks, it seems like a long time, but I don't think in the lifetime of a myasthenia gravis patient it's so long. And so I think you either have to be prepared to go out quite a bit longer or just not use 
steroid sparing as an endpoint in these clinical trials. The other thing is, it, in this trial, there was um, a definite mandate about how you had to taper the steroids. And I guess you have to do that in a clinical study and the other studies. But I have a feeling that that's not really applicable to all patients and therefore might skew the results. I guess one of the thoughts I had about these studies is given the success rate of reducing steroids in the placebo group, what implication, I guess, does this have for our general approach to steroid tapering? And in your trial, just to be clear, these patients had to have failed a prior attempt, which makes it maybe a little different from the others. But are we too cautious in slowly tapering steroids in our patients with myasthenia, do you think? I think we may be a little too cautious at higher doses, but not at the lower doses. Because in this study, patients both in the IVIG arm and the placebo arm had severe relapses and there were deaths, right? And patients, even when they deteriorated and were admitted to hospital and retreated or, you know, the doses were increased and and put to high levels, did not necessarily respond. So, I would say at the higher dose levels, more than, say, 20 milligrams a day as in this study, you might be tapering faster. But below that, you should taper very slowly. And I think it's even possible that you'll not be able to withdraw steroids completely at lower levels in the myasthenia patients. Yeah, so Jim Albers, who I know you know well, was one of my clinical mentors, always warned me to try very hard not to stop very low-dose steroids because bad things happen if you do, and I know we've all seen this in practice. How do you approach that clinically, particularly in the context of what you already shared, which were there were some significant adverse events in terms of myasthenia gravis exacerbation crisis and deaths in patients who did come completely off their steroids? When do you make a decision to actually stop low-dose steroids? That is the challenge, and I'm not sure I know the answer or that the answer is known. I must admit, when I get to low doses of steroids, and I think that low doses are 5 milligrams a day or even 10 milligrams a day or 20 on alternate days, I go very slowly, and I wouldn't taper more than every six months. And I have gone down to ridiculous things like five milligrams twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays for a year. Then I may go to five milligrams once a week for a year. I don't know what that does. And then I might try to withdraw patients. I want to give them long enough at each very low dose to get worse if they are, so I can go up just a little bit. But even with this kind of regimen, you'll have people who have a relapse after you come off, although it may not be immediate. It may be in a few months. So I really do endorse what uh, Jim Albers said and what you do and I think I do. And the general practice is that at very low doses, you go very, very slow. And really, a dose of five milligrams twice a week isn't going to be harmful to that patient. And I have no idea why that might hold them in balance without a relapse, but it really does. You know, Jim would always tell patients that it was like putting out a fire You need a lot of water at the beginning, but you only need a teeny bit of water to keep the embers from flaring up. So that's obviously not sophisticated immunology, but kind of made sense to me. I wonder if we could talk mechanism a bit. You know, one of the conclusions, Vera, that you include in the paper is that it's likely that IVIG and corticosteroids may have different mechanisms of action. That seems probably true. How do you think that explains um, the results of the trial? I mean, you talk about length of the study, but I guess where I'm going is, are there situations where you use the two treatments together? And does this trial inform that? There are situations where I still use the two treatments together. And those are situations where I've had the patient on corticosteroids. I can't get down because they keep getting worse. I may have added a non-steroidal immunosuppressant that hasn't worked, or they may just be not well, and I put IVIG uh, with them. I have a, a cohort of patients on chronic IVIG and also subcutaneous immunoglobulin. So those patients are also on steroid and IVIG. So they are not identical in their effects on the immune system now. (laughs) I say that, although I don't know what all the effects on the immune system are or what specific effects 
IVIG has that improves myasthenia. And I don't know that with corticosteroids either. Corticosteroids are a broad spectrum immunosuppressive drug that seems to act across different areas of the immunopathology. But IVIG also has multiple effects. Further, I don't think every patient with myasthenia gravis has the exact same predominant mechanism producing their disease. So that I think the drugs, the treatments, corticosteroids and IVIG, work synergistically or at different elements of the immune system. And, you know, you and I both know that not everybody will respond to corticosteroids. Not everybody will respond to IVIG. So, First of all, just because there's an immune disease doesn't mean they'll respond to the immune therapy. But second, they have different types of immune changes with the antibodies that can be binding, blocking, or leading to degradation, or leading to complement deposition. And then, so that they don't all have the same major underlying pathogenesis, and therefore different drugs can act at different parts of the abnormal immune cycle. Sure makes you wish for better biomarkers that could help inform treatment selection because, of course, it's not just IVIG and corticosteroids or traditional steroid sparing agents that we have to consider now. We have all of these new therapeutics, FCRN inhibitors, complement inhibitors. So um, hopefully more work in that space. Yeah, absolutely. My final question, Vera, is just to reflect on our conversation. How have the results of this study changed your overall treatment approach to myasthenia? Well, it hasn't changed my practice in very slow tapering of corticosteroids at low doses. That has been reinforced by what are actually shocking results in this, where patients were dying in the study, right, as you withdrew steroids. So first of all, my approach of very slow tapering has been reinforced, but also I'm more reserved with the patients now about the potential of being able to reduce their corticosteroid dose just because I'm adding IVIG. I may improve their overall state, but it doesn't equate to reducing their corticosteroid dose any differently than if I didn't put IVIG into their regimen. And also at the higher levels, it encourages, of corticosteroids, it encourages me, the results here, to drop the dose a little faster. Well, Vera, thanks so much for joining me. This has been a fun conversation, an informative conversation to have. I encourage all of our listeners to check out the trial it's a really, really interesting study, an important study, and uh, congratulations. You've done a lot of important work in lots of different diseases, but helping us understand how to treat myasthenia. So thanks for sharing your perspectives today. My great pleasure, Gordon. Very nice to talk to you. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes. Or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.